Okay, we are going to begin this week's Pasha Kitavo, which is in chapter 26 of Devarim. And these are the last two mitzvahs that Moshe tells Am Yisrael in the rest of the Parsha beyond this. And the next few Parshas are all really a sum up of the mitzvahs, the purpose of the nation, purpose of the Torah, uh, and the encouragement to bring about the, the world that the Torah needs. So, so uh, we begin this week's Parsha with two mitzvahs, which actually show up already beforehand. And these mitzvahs are not new here. Uh, but they are the two final commandments, the two final mitzvahs that Moshe tells Am Yisrael. And we begin with uh, 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 26a, uh, uh, 1. And it will be when you come to the land and you inherit the land, which Hashem gave you as an inheritance, you will take the first of the fruit, which it already tells in the Torah elsewhere that the first fruit need to be brought to the base of Mikdash. Here it says you will bring it. And... Um, uh, you'll bring it from the land that Hashem has given you and you will put it inside a basket and you take it to the place that Hashem has commanded you uh, uh, that Hashem chose to dwell his, uh, uh, there and you will bring it there and you will bring it to the coin and by bringing it, you will tell him my bringing this, that's the words and you will tell, say to him, I am saying, I am telling All right, so this is a very unique statement in verse 3, it says and you will tell him, I, he got it to I have today um, told this story. So what, what is this double? So you'd say to him that my very coming today tells a story. What story does it tell? My, first, my bringing of the first of the fruits says today to you uh, that Hashem Elekech, Hashem your God, uh, I know that the land which I am in is the land you promised my ancestors and gave to them. Very fascinating idea here. And Rashi says, what are you telling? What is the words? Well, the words, it says, you will tell him, I have, I have today said, I have today told the story of the, to Hashem that the land that uh, I have is essentially a gift from uh, Hashem as an inheritance uh, from, uh, you know, on, uh, as a promise to my, my ancestors. But what you're saying is, that you are not paying back goodness with a disregard for the blessings you've had. That's a very fascinating thing. The concept of kafui tova, denying literally, it means like sort of denying the goodness you've received versus hakarat hatova the recognition of goodness. Now, uh, this is distinct from last week. Last week, we also had a Hakara Sato concept, which was where you have to treat the Egyptian very well on account of that you dwelt in his land, right? That's you know, a very uh, difficult concept. You dwelt in his land. He, he, you know, he gave you some straw to sleep on. No, he let you sleep on the floor after he beat you. Like that's not really, but nevertheless, you dwelt there there is a certain amount of appreciation for that part that we have to have. But this is a little different. This is, the in, this is an essential uh, recognition. And how did he show that by bringing the first fruit? So here's the idea. And this is a very, a, a very interesting concept. When, when we um, own something, it's our own. No one really takes has a right to take before we do. Yes, we can share with others, but it first comes to us and then we bestow it to others. We share the goodness and blessings we have, but it always goes to the owner first. When somebody is a sharecropper in a field and they harvest, they have to recognize whose field it is by, by paying up. That's a, an essential part of the deal because ultimately it belongs to the owner and they allow you to work the field. And as a, in return, you get to keep some of the crops, but you, you have to recognize whose field it really is. When we take the first of the fruit, it's distinct from all other mitzvahs that pertain to produce. All other mitzvahs of produce are after it's developed. 
the, you know, the most developed is challah, right? We need dough, and then we take off a piece of challah to show the blessing we have, and this comes from Hashem, and the recognition that even though we've created a new creation, we took the wheat and ground it down to dust, added some material, some wet ingredients, and voila, we now made a dough, and we're going to bake it into a bread. Uh, recognize where this came from, recognize who it came from, take a piece off. That recognition is at the end of the process. Same goes for tithing. After you've harvested, after you bring it in, ah, now you tithe, you give a gift. The, this is unique, that this is not after the blessings, after you've already built and taken in. This is prior to the first of it. By bringing the first fruit to Hashem, what you're saying is I recognize the field I work is really yours. It's an inheritance I got from you, Hashem. So by bringing this fruit, he literally is making a statement. He got it to Hayom. I state today by my actions, I state that I have arrived to the land, not my land, to the land that you promised my ancestors. It's your land, Hashem. And I am a sheer cropper in your land. And so first and foremost, I give you because it's a, a recognition of whose land it really is, whose world it really is. This is the last of the two mitzvahs, right? The last two mitzvahs. Moshe is telling Am Yisrael a sort of a finale of all the mitzvahs. We are living in the world, in Hashem's world, in God's world. Lashem ha'aretzim lo'a, to Hashem is the world and all that's in it. That awareness for us is sometimes very difficult. And especially when you, when you plant and you harvest, you feel like, ah, look at that beautiful fruit that I, that I made. I worked a field, I tended to it, I tended to the tree, and now the first fig is growing. And you feel pride. And you ought to because you worked hard. But you ought to also know whose tree is it. Whose earth is it? Whose nature is it? How is it that a seed disintegrates in the ground and then grows into a tree? And that tree then develops and produces a fruit. How was it that the sun shone the right times and the, and, and, and the rain came at the right times and the wind was just right and it allowed for that fruit to ripen and be juicy and healthy and, and delightful? Yes, it's true, I worked hard, utilizing the field, the world that Hashem gave me. And so the first produce goes to the owner of the field. And so he says to the coin, by bringing this first fruit, I have stated I am not a denier of the goodness, meaning I recognize where all that blessing comes from. It comes from Hashem. And that is the statement that he makes. And in order to define that and, and really spell it out, he now answers and responds to the blessing in verse five with this. And you will state out loud in front of Hashem your God, my ancestors were, 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 were lost. Others tried to kill them. And you recognize these verses from the Haggadah, right? Arami uh, Ovidavi. My ancestors were, were, my, were, were uh, lost Arameans, or the Aramean tried to destroy them. And they went down to Egypt, and they dwelt there with a few, and they became there an, a, a great nation, mighty and plenty and many. And the Egyptians it were bad to us, hurt us, pained us, and gave us very difficult work. We cried out to Hashem, He heard our voice, and he saw our pain and our toil and our pressure. And in the Agada, we break these down to what each one of these is saying. But the concept is our own recognition. Did we reach here on our own merit? Or is it a miracle that we're here today? We are people not because we had borders and a, and a, a, and a mighty army and we were able to create our culture. No, we became a people in a place that we were not allowed to even be human. That's where we became a nation. 
in that crucible, in that fire pit, in that slavery, we became a great nation right there. And that's the statement that we make. We recognize we didn't become a nation because we had land. We got land because we were a nation. The reverse of all other nations. What makes someone Irish is because they are from those borders. What makes someone you know, Chinese or they are from those borders? What makes someone in Nepalese from those borders? What makes someone a Yehudi, Am Yisrael? Not the borders. We became a nation where in a, within a place that we were the untouchables, that we were a, a people that were not allowed to be a people. That's where we became a people. We weren't allowed to be human, and we became a people. But Vayi Sham, right there in the midst of all that oppression, we became a nation. Goy Gadol, a great nation. Atzum Varav, many and strong. And Hashem heard us and took us out. And so when we see the blessing of a land, it's easy to say, oh, this is my land. This is my inheritance. So we state no. We actually recognize where that comes from. We are living in the land, in the world of Hashem. I'm not denying that goodness, the blessing Hashem has given us. And you brought me in verse 9, and you brought me to this place, and you've given me this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now, since I recognize I am not a nation on account of my borders or my might or my strength. I'm a nation that became a nation in, 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 in the most oppressive of places. I'm a nation not on account of land, but I have land on account of my, my nationhood. Ah, so therefore this land is yours, Hashem. Not our nation's. It's yours. You gave it to us. You allow us to come here. You allow us to be here. And you gave us this land flowing in milk and honey. And so the first of the fruit. So now, verse 10, the first of the fruit I bring to you. The first of the fruit of the land which you gave me. The land is yours. And I put it before Hashem. And then we bow to Hashem. And that's why this requires bowing. Because it's a recognition of who's the boss. It's a recognition of whose land this really is. And so this is the last of the mitzvahs, but there's a fascinating thing. It ends on verse 11, this mitzvah. Once you've done so, once you've recognized where this comes from, what does Hashem want us to do with the blessings we have? Please, Hashem wants us to be joyous with the blessings we have. So often we have blessings and we're just not happy with it. So often we have blessings and we don't live up to the blessing. Be joyous. Live happy with all the goodness that Hashem has given you. To you and your household. And share that goodness, you and the levy and the foreigner that's amongst you. If you have blessing, if the blessing is yours, Okay, so you try, some people are going to be stingy and some people are going to be gracious. But it's not yours. I make the statement, it's not mine. I'm only a sharecropper. It's not mine. It belongs to the creator of all human beings. And so the blessing I have is going to make me joyous and happy. And I'm going to live with that. But not only me. You and the levy and the foreigner, the ger, everybody. Share that blessing, because if you live with goodness, it will be so. Not only that, but this blessing and this joy have to elevate us to the next level as well. The halacha is, v'samachta b'chol hatov, teaches us that we must sing song when we bring this food. The idea is that we have to live with joy, not just an inner joy, but it must, it must elevate us to where there's an expression of that joy. So often, even if we're happy with the blessings Hashem gives us, we don't allow it to overflow. 
We don't allow it to bless others. We don't allow it to, to elevate others. It needs to come up and bring to a point of song, which is bringing that goodness to others and showing it and sharing it with others. And so this is the, 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 the second to last mitzvah, the recognition where our land comes from, where our blessing comes from, living with that, sharing the blessing, and, a, and making sure that we do so in joy and happiness, but not just an inner joy, and a joy that comes to expression of song and thanks and elevation. The next mitzvah, which is a verse 12, um, all the way to Shalishi, from Shani to Shalishi, is uh, the, the Vidui Maser. We have a six-year system of of produce, of working the land. The seventh year, the land will be fallow. There are two sets of three in that six year. For the first two years, you tithe to the levy, and then you tithe for yourself and you bring it to Eretz Yisrael, to Yerushalayim. Then the same goes for the next two, to the fourth and fifth, uh, fifth year. However, the third and the sixth year, you don't tithe for yourself. There's a new tithe a separate tithe, and this tithe goes to the poor. And this is a maser, a tithe, that goes to the poor at, to, to the uh, third and sixth year. And so at those years, after the crops are, are uh, done, you have to make a statement, a vidui maser, a statement saying that I did not mistreat the, the maser, the tithe. I lived up to what the requirements of the tithe. Of the tithe. I did not eat any of it when, uh, when I was in sadness, in mourning. I, I, I treated it correct. I, did, I gave it to whoever was supposed to go to. That's the video maestro. I treated the tithe as it was supposed to be done. The tithing is uh, distinct from the bikurim, the first fruit. The first fruit, as we said, is a recognition of whose land it really is. The, this, the tithe is, is sharing the blessing and saying, look, I did produce, I worked hard and I have a blessing, I have plenty, but I must live in the consciousness and in the awareness of Hashem. And so I must take the fruit and eat it in Yerushalayim, in the presence of the, the within sight of the, the temple of the Beis HaMikdash. I must do so with the consciousness of the holiness. And I must treat it as such by not eating when, when I'm in mourning and not in tame. I have to live with that deep connection. Elevate this physical as well, the blessings I have. But I also must eventually share that with the poor and with those that are needy. And that's what this mitzvah is, to state it and to recognize it. But this ends with a prayer. The previous part does not end with a prayer because the previous part was a recognition of thanks, a recognition of, of who I owe everything to. If you thank someone and then ask for more, it almost sounds like the thanks is just so you can get it again. Oh, thank you so much for having lent your car to me last week. Can I use it again? Right? You know what that sounds like? That's like, oh, I need to ask again, and so I want to thank for the last time. But no, that recognition must be a thanks and only a thanks. And so we don't ask for anything else when, when giving thanks. But when we're living and sharing blessing, then we ask for more blessing. And that's what we say over here at the, uh, at the end. He says, Look down upon us from your heavenly abode. Now, of course, Hashem is in this world as well. But if we live up to sharing the goodness of this world with others, then Hashem allows us to partake in this world. There's a Gemara in Brachas. The Gemara says that there's a contradiction. It says, Lashem ha'aretzim loa. It says, to Hashem is the earth and all that's in it. And it says, Shamayim Shamayim Lashem. The heavens are for Hashem. Gemara says it depends. Did you make a bracha? Did you not make a bracha? If you made a bracha, it's already yours. You have a right to utilize the world because you recognize the blessing you have, and therefore you will utilize the blessings you have to share and make the world a better place. 
And so then Hashem allows us to have it. However, if we don't, if we're just taking and just trying to maintain for ourselves, to hold on to it, so then it all belongs to me, Hashem says. Now that we've shared and, 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 and uh, done the tithe and given to the poor and given to the levy, we say and we've, and we've verbalized and we've uttered our statement of recognition that this is to elevate us and give us, and we do so in a state of joy and happiness and purity. Then we turn to Hashem and say, please look down from the heavens above. Bless your nation, Yisrael, and the land which you gave to us. Again, that recognition. As you promised our ancestors, a land flowing in milk and honey. As Rashi says, we've done our part. We've lived up to living on this earth with the joy and the happiness and the sharing and the goodness that you expect of us. Please allow it to continue and give us the blessings that we uh, need in order to continue the life and the work you want us to have. And after Shalishi, after uh, the third, uh, the beginning of the third Aliyah, which is a verse uh, 16 in chapter 26 and on, Moshe begins a, a, a motivational speech and also, you know, the challenges to Am Yisrael. He says, Hayom Hashem kemela. Today, Every single day anew, Hashem commands you the mitzvahs to do those mitzvahs. But not only to do the mitzvahs, the statutes and the laws, but v'shamarta, you must guard them. So there are different meanings to the word v'shamarta. There is a meaning of you will guard them, meaning take care that they are protected. By guarding, it means that you take offense, you, you make offense, you make a protective uh, guard, right? When you guard something, you don't just, uh, uh, you know, make sure it doesn't get uh, uh, damaged, but you create protective uh, protections around it so it doesn't get damaged. You do so by adding bubble wrap to the, the you know, to the china, whatever it may be. You, you, you create that protection, and that's what the shamarta, one meaning of a shamarta. But there's another meaning of a shamarta as well. When Yaakov heard Yosef's dreams, and the brothers were upset. And he said, Yosef, what are you thinking? He rebuked his son. And then the Torah says, even though he publicly rebuked his son, Aviv shamar et adavar, he guarded that matter. What does it mean he guarded it? He held it, he held on to it. He was waiting for that to come to fruition. That's what it means to guard. When you love something, when you care about something, then you guard it. You wait for it and you seek and, and you hope for it to happen. We can look at mitzvahs as, look, you know, we got to do it, we got to do it. Or we can wait for it. Think of the chag you like most and you really wait for it. It's like, that's oh, a delight. It's not a burden. Think of a moment in life that you, that you like, whether it's visiting children or, 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 or a friend or a moment or a vacation. You wait for it. You guard it, meaning you wait for it and you yearn for it and you hope for it. That's the way we live with Torah. We can live with Torah. All right, it's a burden. We got to do it. I'll do it because I recognize the world I'm in. Or... Uh, or we can, we can actually yearn and, and, and hope for it. And that's v'shamar, v'shamar tavasita. You will, and you will you hold on to that, guard it and seek it and do um, with all your heart and soul. And then there's a term here that's unknown. Rashi says, it doesn't show up elsewhere in Tanakh. Es Hashem he'emarta ahiyom. You have this new word, ha'emarta, you did this to Hashem. So, unkelis, it translates in the Aramaic, you bundled yourself with Hashem, and Hashem has bundled you, himself with you. Meaning, there's a bond relationship with Hashem by doing this, by accepting the Torah, living up to it, 
recognizing the relationship with Hashem in the universe we live in, in the world we live in. By doing so, you have a connection with Hashem. You've connected yourself uh, um, with Hashem. But Rashi says, and he thinks that the word comes from uh, to separate and dedicate yourself. And he says, this is the word of Tif Eret. It's a glory. You know what a glory is? You know what something is beautiful? It's beautiful because you look at it and you like it and you appreciate what you're looking at. That's beauty. When, we, when, two, when a couple or two people have a relationship, that relationship is because they look at each other. And when they do something and they see that goodness in the other, it, that in and of itself is the reward. That in and of itself is the blessing. You have created this beauty that you see the beauty in the mitzvahs of Hashem, in the relationship with Hashem. And Hashem sees the beauty in you as people who want that. That relationship of just, just looking at each other, just having that glory and the beauty in each other. That's what this says here. You have chosen to be in living with Hashem, in looking and seeing the beauty in Hashem, and as such, to, to go in His ways. To go in His ways means to recognize Hashem's compassion and the way He wants us to live with compassion. And so we do that. And Hashem it builds others up, it gives opportunity. So we need to give opportunity. The Torah says, you shall go in the ways of Hashem, and the Gemara tells us that means mahurachum afatarachum. Just as He is compassionate, so to you shall be compassionate. Just as he is gracious, so shall you should be gracious. Just as he is forgiving, you shall be forgiven. That ability to elevate above oneself, to be altruistic, to be caring and sharing, that is uh, because of the relationship that we have with Hashem, because of the soul we have, and because of the love we have for the teachings and the way that Hashem taught us to, to, to hear His voice. L'shma b'kola means we, we seek to listen. Moshe tells Am Yisrael, when you do that, you've created a relationship that's, that's uh, uh, so strong and so defining that you've now defined yourself as in relationship with Hashem. And as a result, Hashem Hashem responds in kind, and has that same relationship with you that you are now precious people to him, as he promised it would be, in order that the mitzvah can be kept together. And not only that, but it's not only for the Jew, it's for the entire world. And so therefore, Hashem makes it so that you would also be a place of elevation so that all the nations of the world will be able to see and learn from that way of living, the way of living with Hashem, the way of living in the Word, the way of living with the recognition that the world we have is not ours. The world we have belongs to Hashem, a higher power, who wills us to have it so that we can live in this relationship. Hashem says, I put you as an Elyon, as an elevation above, on all the nations so that they can have praise themselves and they themselves can have that glory and they themselves can have that beauty. So for that, you have to be an Am Kadosh. You must be a holy nation, a nation dedicated to elevating not only yourselves, but the entire world. And at that point, Moshe, Moshe tells the, uh, the Jews to cross it, to set up that when they cross into the land, they're going to have to set up stone tablets that are going to list all the mitzvahs and have this um, uh, 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 altar built and write the words um, uh, of the Torah on it in all uh, in languages so that everybody can have access to Torah. In verse nine, Moshe, you have a question. The stone, how many, I mean, it seems like such a difficult thing to write so much on a few stones with plaster. How, what is the... What, well, what they, they used to chisel into stone, right? That, that's right. the way they used to write a lot. And so right. they would have to have uh, either enormous stones or, or many stones and then build it into an altar. 
and build it into a, a, a structure. But it seems like they had a single stone that was large and they were able to write. I mean, we have the Rosetta Stone, right? True. Yeah. But we have, we have mm -hmm. a living testament of something like that from a much later date, but that kind mm -hmm. of concept where you have a lot written on a stone, right? So, so we have the existence of such items all, you know, even today that we have. So we know that they knew how to do that. And so it just, you know, that, that it, it was a tedious task for sure. <laughs> I would imagine. Yeah. <laughs> Very tedious. Okay. Thank you. Sure. And now Moshe says, okay, listen, B'nai Yisrael, listen well, because today you become a nation. Now they became a nation before, right? We just read they became a nation in Mitzrayim. Yes, but now you have your purpose. Now you are a nation to Hashem, not just a nation, but now you are a nation to Hashem, your God. Up until now, you were a nation as a people. Now you're a nation with a creed. Now you're a nation with a purpose. Now you're a nation with a Torah. And you will hear the voice of Hashem and do the mitzvah and the statutes that he commands you. The next section, which is after Chamishi, the fifth Aliyah, verse 11 and on, begins the separation onto the two mountains, which we talked about a few weeks ago, where you have the, uh, the mountain that's barren and the mountain that's fr uh, luscious and, and, and fruitful. And on uh, one, the blessings were said and one of the curses were said. And there's a whole list of, of curses. We, we'll go through it quickly. Uh, cursed is the one who, who makes idolatry. Cursed is the one who, who strikes their parents. Cursed is the one who steals or moves the boundaries from others that, that breaks it. Cursed is the one who, 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 who misleads a blind person on the way. And this doesn't have to be a physically blind person, but even someone who is, you just mislead someone in advice knowingly. That's a, that's a, that's a curse. Um, one who, who, who is unjust and taking advantage of those that are weak. One who uh, has illicit relations. Uh, one who uh, strikes someone in, in, in hiding. They, that also doesn't have to be physically. It could also be um, uh, uh, someone who speaks against someone else, right? Lashon hara, someone who slanders, someone who speaks ill about someone behind their back. One who takes, takes bribes. And the last is the culminator of all of this. One who does not uphold the words of this Torah. One who does not hold the Torah high and precious and doesn't value this greatest of gifts that Hashem gave us as a way to not only connect with Him, but to live the ultimate and elevated life that we can. And, yes? What is the significance of the different tribes, some that were on Mount Grizeba, Grizim, and the other, other? Is there a significance? There must be some significance. There it? absolutely is. There's a lot of explanation given yeah. exactly why some went on one and some of the other is unclear okay. um, uh, to me. Um, I've seen many interpretations, none that have really uh, uh, satisfied me. Um, it, it, the idea is that each one is representing the idea of we can either be here or there. But why specifically some were chosen here and some were chosen there? And it doesn't seem like I, you know, I'd want to be on the blessed mountain. But everybody right. can choose the blessed mountain <laughs> if, we, if we live to that. And that's really the message. If you live up to it, every mountain's blessed, right? It's the choice is ours. That's really the message. But nevertheless, some got to be on one mountain, some got to be on the other. And, you know, I, I'd be there saying, hey, why am I on this mountain? I want to be on that one. So right. I, I don't have a satisfactory okay. answer at this point. Thank you. Uh, verse, uh, chapter 28. And here we begin blessings that come to those that do good. And the Torah's blessings are so beautiful. Blessed are you in the city and blessed are you in the field. Blessed are the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your field and the fruit of your animals and, and, and your herds, etc. Your 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 baskets will be fruitful. Blessed are you when you come and blessed are when you go. 
Hashem will make your enemies who try and hurt you fall before you, and they will run from you, and Hashem will bless all of your, your, your produce, and all that you touch with your hands, all the work you do will be blessed. Yeah. And uh, Hashem will establish you as a holy nation and when you keep the mitzvahs and all the nations will look at you and they would recognize the, the, the godliness of the Torah and our actions and our nationhood. And Hashem will just leave so much blessing, so much extra for, for your descendants and your families. The, mount, the heavens will open up and shower you with blessings. I'm in verse 12 now. The earth will be uh, uh, satiated with the rains. Hashem will make you a, above a head and not a tail. And you will ele- be constantly ele- elevating and not slipping down because you listen to the words of Hashem and you will not turn away and you go after the words of Hashem. And in verse f- 15, it t- says, and what happens if does, if you don't? And it goes and it t- speaks about the 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 opposite and, and, and terrible tragedies that will happen to Am Yisrael. And indeed, so much of this, if we look at it uh, throughout our history, befell our people. I just want to uh, point out one verse, which is so striking and so meaningful when we look at, so why, uh, you know, why is this? How could, it ha- how could it be that people who have a Torah and are so elevated and or have a relationship with Hashem, slip away this way, and this, this befalls them. Uh, so verse 45, 46, and 47 tell us the secret to, to, to this tragedy. And all these curses will come upon you, and they will not only come upon you, but they will chase you and, and, and reach you, because you did not heed the verse of Hashem your God to keep his mitzvahs, his statutes that he commanded. And it'll be a sign and a symbol for you and your descendants that something like this could happen to you. Why? On account of that you did not serve Hashem, your God, with joy and a good heart, out of the plenty of all that you have. This is in the simplest reading, the way Rashi has this, and we see this elsewhere as well. The simplest reading is, we see later and next week, uh, uh, it says, Vayishman Yeshurun Vayivat. Yeshurun, the most upright, become fat, and then they kick it away. When we become uh, too hedonistic, too connected with the physical, too in- involved in self-servingness. We forget our way. Not only we forget it, we kick it away. So what brought us to this place? Because we did not have gratefulness. We were not appreciative. The simcha, we did not serve Hashem in joy. It's such an amazing thing that the more we have, the less we're happy with. Years ago, someone gave me a, 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 ha- a magazine called Happiness Magazine. It's an interesting magazine. And it did a study and asked uh, people in certain uh, financial brackets how much more they need to be happy. So people you know, under 30,000 said another $5,000 and they'd be happy. From 30 to 50 said you know, they need like $10,000, $12,000 and they'll be happy. People in $70,000 bracket said they need you know, 20 and they'd be happy. People in the $200,000 bracket, and you could see where this goes, right? We always think, if only I had that much more, I'd be happy. The more we have, sometimes the less happy we are. Happiness is not on account of what we have. And in fact, sometimes it's, it's, it's despite all we have. And sometimes the all we have is what makes us unhappy. And so he says that Mirovkol, on account of all the blessing and the goodness we have, that's how we turn bad. That's how we turn unhappy. We didn't serve Hashem in happiness. You know, there is a certain uh, 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 ability that people who have so much can be nuanced and say, you know, I don't like that word you used, I'm offended. 
when somebody really is struggling to make ends meet, they don't have time for that. They don't have the blessing of plenty to be able to get down and, 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 and be unhappy. The little achievements they have make them so happy. We have to not lose that because that's what this is saying. You know what happened to this people? They had so much and so much blessing that they were just unhappy about minutia. And there's another uh, uh, deeper level as well. We have, the term coal means everything. It is possible for us to have coal, to have everything. We have everything in, in music. We have everything in food. We have everything in the arts. We have, there are many aspects also in our attributes. We have the ability to have everything in our kindness and everything, so many everythings. That's what it says. In the multitude, may rove, which is multitude, coal of everything. We have so many everythings that we don't focus, that we don't have a path. We don't have a direction. And then we don't serve Hashem with happiness. The, and, and it's such a deep message. The Pasha begins with, and in this message, message ends with, the need to not only have the blessing, but to utilize the blessings to bring us to a state of joy and to share that joy with others. And when we do, Hashem will bless us more and bless us with others to bring the world to a complete new stage. Let's utilize that. Let's work on this. We're coming up to Rosh Hashanah, a new year. It's been a troubling year, but we have so much good and so much blessing. Let's focus on that. Let's share that and let's serve Hashem in our lives with simcha and tuv with gladness, happiness, and a good heart.